Um, so the Indaba started as a totally random story because um, um, a few of us had a dream to um, one day bring a big conference like ICML to Africa. And um, the problem with big conferences like ICML or in Europe's um, and hosting them in Africa initially was that if you hosted a big conference like ICML um, in Africa, people would parachute in, have a big conference, and then disappear. And nothing actually changes on the ground. Um, and, um, and about three or four years ago, there was another thread on, uh, on Facebook that says, well, why don't we bring ICML to Africa? And at that point, my company, DeepMind, was thinking about diversity and, um, and announced that diversity is interesting. And we thought, well, this is a great idea to pounce and get an idea to, to our, um, our, our CEO. And at the same time, Benji over there, please raise your hand. Oh, Benji, why did you stand up? And, uh, and Richard over here. These, these people have also slaved away in the, in the early years. So we pounced and we said, if you, if you give us a tiny bit of money and one week off work, um, we'll host a machine learning um, workshop, sort of an advanced set of lectures for students in Africa. We will, in Johannesburg, we'll do it for maybe 20 to 30 PhD students at most. There can't be more than 30 people that, we, that would be interested in, in AI. Anyway, so, um, so, so um, we opened applications for, for the first Indaba, and we had 700 applicants. And uh, we thought we'd get um, 40, <laughs> which posed, actually posed a big problem, because we booked a lecture room for 40 people. <laughs> we didn't think about accommodation. Um, and at that point, this is now three years ago, it said, what's the biggest lecture hall in the University of Witwatersrand Run that, um, that you could find? And Benji and Richard here said, well, there is a room that hosts 300 people. So we said, OK, 300. It would be nice if it could be 700, but 300 is the, is the cut up for the first Indaba. And so this thing has just grown into really a movement. It's extremely grassroots. Every Indaba is an experiment. This is the first time ever that we're hosting someone at something at this scale in, in Kenya. So it's a new experience for us, as it is for all of you. And um, before we kick off Bayesian inference, um, our request for you for this Indaba, and we'll talk about this tomorrow, is that you really buy into the vision of strengthening machine learning in Africa. Um, this kind of meeting is not like a normal conference or summer school where um, uh, you come and you receive. This is more a place where you come and you participate and you learn and you take things away and you take it to where you are and you continue with the vision of growing. So we're an ex in ex extremely young, inclusive, um, very experimental community. We were also fast moving, except for um, some things like the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with that said, um, step one for Bayesian inference, and this is the interest. Please make sure you have something to write with, um, because you'll do a lot of writing. Um, the next one is that um, I'm doing this session because um, there's a lot of confusion about what Bayesian inference is. So the purpose of the session is really just to allow you to see the wood from the trees. Like the big picture of what Bayesian inference is instead of um, all the nitty-gritty details. And we'll go through one mathematical derivation, so there will be a bit of algebra. I'll talk you through it very, very slowly. Um, so what's the big deal of Bayesian inference? And this is where you need to take your pen and paper. Um, I'm giving you um, a data set, and it, has, it only has two examples. We've got an x-axis and, and a y-axis. And I assume that my um, data is, the, is um, y is a function of x plus some noise. And my question for you here is to um, draw any function that you think fits the data very well, these two data points. Give it a quick go. It's important that you all do it because um, we're going to get to Bayesian inference because you all do it. Okay, I'll give you 30 seconds because it's not difficult. Okay, have you done it? People at the back, have you tried? Can you see? Who needs more time? You good? Okay. Now, 
Okay, what's the big deal? Um, who drew a straight line through the data? Okay, most of you. So, most of you did something like this, Oops, like that. Who of you did anything else? Yes. Okay, someone at the back. Oh, parabola. So, this way or that way? Okay, this way. Okay, and I'm sure there are many, many, many more. Who did something else? Yes. Oh, okay, here we have something. We've got one constant line through the data. Okay, so let's undo all of these. Okay, now, I'll give you a few more data points. Um, now, please take some time and adapt your function to, to fit these data points. Okay, quick show of hands. Um, who did um, who did the straight line through them? Okay, we've got a few straight lines. Um, <coughs> who of you? So we've got a few straight lines. That's not a straight line. <laughs> That's the wrong thing. Okay, who of you um, did some sort of parabola? Okay, loads of parabolas. Which way? Going that way? Yes. Okay, hopefully you've got some people doing that. Um, who of you um, have any other function? Yeah, yes. Polynomial. A polynomial? With, oh, great. So we've got some polynomials that go like that maybe. Who of you have? Yes. A sine function. A sine function. I was hoping for someone who'd put a sine function. <laughs> um, find this a sine function, too, like that. Um, <laughs> any, any more functions? Okay. So what can we see from this random draw from the audience is that most of you um, had functions that roughly interpolated the data points, right? But as I moved further left or right on my x-axis, your functions, the ones that you picked, started to differ wildly. And the further you moved from your, the data points I gave you, um, your functions differ more wildly. Okay, so you're all clear on that. Um, okay, so we did a Q&A. Okay, so here's the take home message. All of you had different functions. Secondly, each of you probably updated, updated your function after you've seen new data in some way. And thirdly, um, we've seen that all of your functions differed um, where there was an absence of data. So now let's do one more. Okay, so I'm giving you another data point, a fifth one. Okay, please update your function again. Okay, this is an interesting one. You guys at the back, can you see what's happening? Can you see at the back? Yes. Right, this is a big debate. Um, so what, um, what functions do we have now? Big polynomials. Big polynomials. Um, a ball. Uh, a ball with all of them inside. Oh, okay, this is a really interesting one. So, um, so you assume that your noise distribution is such that um, There should, that um, this, your function is bimodal. No, that's totally possible in Bayesian inference. Like, why could the, the noise distribution could at some point like split the function up or down? Um, the other big debate is what on earth, what on earth do you do with that extra point? Maybe the person who was um, typing in the data set, um, their finger slipped and they accidentally just put it at zero. Maybe. Um, Maybe there was just so much noise that that's actually real data, 0, 0.00. It's part of your process. Maybe it was a sensor failure. Um, so um, so uh, let's vote. Um, who of you think the, the straight line is the best fit for the data? Just for gut, gut feel. OK. Few, including, including some very senior machine learning people think it's a straight line <laughs> at the back. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so do you want to update your guess now? <laughs> um, who of you think this is a really good fit for the data? Okay, also a few hands. Who of you think this is a good fit for the data? Okay, hang on, but if you wanted to run a least squares estimator, like you do in your TensorFlow prax, then this is never going to be the answer that you get. So, um, so that's a problem because all of you think, most of you think that that's the right answer and you all think that whoever typed in the data made a big mistake. But yet, if you were to code a model, that's not what you would get. Okay, so this is really the big deal of Bayesian inference. It allows you to, um, to decide who's right and who's wrong in this crazy debate. And who's right and who's wrong depends on the assumptions that you make. Is that clear? So um, maybe um, for this um, line, uh, maybe you can give me three critical assumptions that you've made as a modeler. Okay, yes? The process is linear. Okay, the process is linear. Um, another assumption for the data. Come, this is, I, I made this slides late at night, so I don't know the three assumptions. <laughs> <laughs> you've made them, yes. Oh, there's a lot of noise. Yes. Okay. I think I heard you correctly. Um, so the assumption is that um, the data is sampled with a lot of noise around my linear function. Um, any other assumptions? Okay. Yes. Our function is continuous. That's another good assumption. Okay. Let's go for the next one. Uh, what assumptions are made to fit this function to the data? Yes. Okay, there's almost no noise. Okay, so the, the, um, the function has to touch almost every data point. Uh, another assumption. Uh, it's continuous. What about it must be some polynomial that's very flexible? Okay. Um, what assumptions should one make if this is, this is what you think about the data? I got one or something else. Someone on that side. Yes. Okay, you assume that that bottom point is outlier. Um, what, can we make an assumption of how bad an outlier it should be? Like, is it is a completely ignore outlier or one that is just a little bit of a mismeasurement? Yeah, well, you also completely ignore it. Um, okay, so we've got an audience who ignores the data and throws it away. <laughs> um, okay. Right. So who's right and who's wrong? This is where Bayesian inference really comes to the rescue. So you, you've now seen that if you want to do inference in data that you have not seen, there's a, there's, there should be something like an error bar or an estimate that tells you how much your data fluctuates. Um, also, you, we've seen from this debate that everyone has assumptions about their data, and to actually make any predictions for your models, you have to be critically clear about the assumptions that you make, like every possible assumption. Okay, so what does Bayes' theorem say? And I'll explain it with regards to the data that we've seen now. So Bayes' theorem says that um, I have data over here, and it decomposes into um, parts that essentially has a likelihood that says what is the probability of my data conditioned on my red function and all the tons of assumptions that I make. So if I have loads of assumptions on noise, for instance, and I plug in my red function, then the data that gets spat out on the other hand would look very different. Okay? So for instance, if my assumptions here is that someone makes a lot of typos, then the kinds of functions, um, the kind of data I get out would have lots of um, points on the zero axis. If there's no assumption on typos, then of course the data would look different. There's another part that's needed, and that is some prior distribution on functions, the red stuff, um, conditioned on my assumptions. So for instance, whoever said uh, my assumptions is that the, the um, data is a sine wave, conditioned on that, um, these red functions would all be sine waves. And then it's normalized by some probability of data given my assumptions. And Bayesian's, Bayes' theorem and Bayesian inference 
tries to solve what's called an inverse problem. So inverse problems are really critical in statistics. There's been great work being done um, through many decades. The great, like Russians in the 1970s were all about the theory of inverse problems, etc. But basically all that this is about is we want to care, we want to find the probability distribution of all our functions given the data. So this just means that as we get more data, the options for functions narrow down. Like you've done, as you've seen more data points, suddenly you, 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 um, you squeeze the possibilities of functions that could possibly pass through your data. Um, so in this, in this case, I'm going to try and condition on all my assumptions, and I'll take it away. And I realize we only have um, about 50 minutes, and then we have to get on a bus to go and party. So I'll try and go a bit fa faster. Um, the key terms here, I'm dropping the assumptions because everyone knows you're making them, and you should really put them in, but it's shorthand. Um, so in, ba in Bayesian inference terms, there's a posterior. The posterior distribution is the product of a likelihood, how well this, the, um, your model supports the data, and the prior, divided by some normalizing constant or evidence. And this actually tells you how well your model models the data. So this number is the number that you're going to use in your debate with your friend because each of you will make assumptions and some of you will get a higher number than others. Okay, so, um, so everything in Bayesian inference follows from two very simple rules. Um, they are the sum rule. The sum rule just says that if I have a joint probability between two random variables, I can get its marginal, which just means that I sum out or integrate out one random variable. The product rule just says that the product, the joint density of two random variables can decompose as essentially something like a prior and likelihood, a marginal and then a conditional on the marginal. So I think if you've all seen this before and um, we should move on to more interesting things. The typical questions you want to ask with Bayesian inference look like this. So first of all, we care about something called the posterior distribution. So at the top line, I've got an equation that says I care about this. So this theta you could see as your rate function, the parameters of your rate function. We care about the posterior the density of my rate function given my data and how it decomposes. The next one is to predict um, for when you've not seen data before. So cranking the calculus of probability again, this decomposes in, into an expression and um, just, if you've never seen this before, it's, it's a lot easier than it looks like. So I care about the probability of a new data point, given all the data I've seen, and in this case, M is my assumptions. So of course, um, my data depends on my rate function, right? On my parameters theta. So this is just the average of my, date, my um, data point, given my rate function average over my posterior distribution. And Bayesian inference is a lot about calculating these integrals. But we'll get to an example. And then the last one, I think we, we can skip for the purpose of this talk. This is to do model comparison. Okay. Um, so now we're going to apply it. So this is where I need you to take your, take your notebooks again. And you're going to fit one function in the next half an hour in a very Bayesian way. Okay. <coughs> so. So let's state our assumptions, and in this case, we're going to try and um, not assume that anyone made any typos in this case, but assume that our noise is uh, Gaussian. So, um, so our first assumption in this case would be that our inputs, x, are independent and identically, well, our y's are independent and identically distributed. So there's in Bayesian inference, there's this thing called Definetti's theorem. It's like, a, uh, it doesn't matter in which order I put things in my likelihood, then the outcome is, outcome is the same. Um, so the next thing is the rate function is an assumption. So we'll write the likelihood of all the y's, our data points, given, the, given all the x's, our input data points, and whatever parameters theta we have for our function as the product of this output given an input, that output given the input, that one, that one, and that one. Is everyone clear of that? So it's just a product of independent observations. Um, and it is very clear that this is an assumption. Um, 
we could have modeled this as some time series with dependencies on the, um, the, the ordering, etc. but we don't. Okay. Do you want to write this down, or are you happy? Good? Back? Yes. Okay. Now, um, to make this thing nonlinear, um, for those of you who wanted nonlinear functions, we're going to um, map it to map uh, input x, which is a single number, to some sort of feature space so that we, we essentially work with linear models. So instead of having a function of x, like 2 times x or 3 times x, I'm going to take my x and I'm going to push it into a larger dimensional vector. So one example, if you want polynomial functions, I'll, I'll expand x into a vector that has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 components, 1x, x squared, x3, x to the power of 4, and then my model will be theta transpose times the vector, so theta will be a five-dimensional vector. Um, if you want to do something right, like radial basis functions, um, for instance, you would pick another expansion where you have a lot of center points and just measure how, much, how far your data is from that center point. Okay, so whenever you see this phi of x, you can imagine a vector that is the same size of theta. So your line is just a linear line. And that's how, that's how we write our red lines. Everyone happy with this? Yes? Am I going too slow, fast? Am I going too fast? Okay, should I just talk you through this part again? Okay, I'll, I'll do, do a quick run through. Um, so to create a red line, um, I want to write the polynomial in a very easy way. So... So if I only had an x point, I could write x or y equals x, or y equals 2 times x, or y equals 3 times x, or y equals theta times x. And that would give me a linear line. And essentially, I could make, um, make my um, phi of x equals 1 and x, just like that. And then whatever two numbers of, of theta I put inside, that will give me a linear line. If I wanted a parabola, like some of you had, I would, I would extend phi of x to three numbers, one x and x squared. And then I'd learn the coefficients that sits in front of the one, x, and the x squared, with the first coefficient being the offset. If I wanted to do higher order polynomials, I just make this vector longer and I learn more weights. Um, that's an easy way to do these thread functions. Okay. Um, so our assumption is that um, you all said that the, um, the data should, in this function, probably be quite close to my red function. Um, so we'll write the likelihood in this way. Um, okay. So my likelihood would be that y over there, I'll, I'll kneel down so you can all see on the screen. Y is a random variable. Um, x is given, this phi of x there is a vector, um, this theta is a vector that I don't know, it's like weights, and that, that gives me the mean, and this thing is a precision or an inverse variance. Now, how it works is that I've got an x, if you can see the x at the bottom there, and I've got an observation y. So what I essentially do is I assume that I've got a, a function with a mean, which is exactly where that red function is. So this point over here that I'm coloring in, that point on the y-axis, remember the y-axis runs here, that point is theta times phi of x. And then I assume that y is generated, let's get a different color, y is generated with some noise. I can draw a Gaussian that way, right? And I assume that y is generated with some noise away from the mean function. Can you see that? Okay. Next up, this number here, this alpha inverse, that's something that I've preset. That's like a variance. That's, that's how far I allow, I allow my blue points to deviate from this red function. Okay. So, of course, if this alpha inverse, if the, um, if the precision is high, if this variance is very small, then, of course, the, the red function should really tuck the, the blue points. 
if that number there is really big, then we've got someone mentioned the process where you've got a lot of noise around your around your base function. Okay. Um, does that make sense for a likelihood? Oh, I wish there was a single undo button. <laughs> I still haven't figured out how to really do this in any other way. Okay, so let's apply this. Yes. Okay, so alpha, alpha sits with our assumptions. Um, um, later on in the talk, we'll, we'll make alpha a, a random variable and put a prior on it, and we can also infer it. But at the moment, or you can treat it as a hyperparameter. Um, but we'll, we'll get to that. Um, at the moment, we, we pick alpha, and that's our assumption. Um, okay, um, so now we need to put a prior on theta. Um, and in this case, I'll put a Gaussian prior on theta. And all this means is that theta are the two weights that I put in front of my, um, or in, number of weights that I put in front of my, um, my vector. And all this means is that if I've got a Gaussian prior on theta, I expect my weight vectors, typical weight vectors, to be with n roughly a range beta from, from zero. Okay? So, so I've got another parameter to beta that says that my vectors could be in a certain range, roughly beta, from zero. Okay, really easy prior, a Gaussian prior. Okay. So this is this where we get to, I um, just want to show you what, what graphical models are, if you've ever heard of that term. So now we have a joint density of y, and my unobserved vector x, uh, theta conditioned on my inputs x. And that decomposes by the rule. There are hands here which says I should let you do it yourself, but, um, but, um, but let's, let's do it here. I never do math in real time in front of people. So what, what would sit inside the exponential for a Gaussian? It would be a minus half um, y I'm leaving subscripts n, minus theta transpose phi of xn, transpose, oh, well, this alpha I can just put in the front, um, y minus theta transpose um, phi of x, and you all know why um, that, 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 that thing over there is in, this thing is my function. Okay, so if I multiply this out, I basically get y transpose y, forgetting about this, I'm ignoring this thing in the front, um, minus, and I multiply the next one out, which be, would be y transpose um, oh, sorry, there's no y is a scalar, sorry, we can remove that, it's just this thing squared, so this is like y squared minus y times that is y theta transpose phi of x. And now I do this term that way, so it's like minus y theta, theta transpose phi of x. And then I do the very last one, which is the complicated one, plus theta transpose phi of x um, theta transpose phi of x. Okay. Right? Does that make sense? We just multiply this whole thing out. Now, um, next thing you need to know is that... Oh, uh, <laughs> this is not how this is supposed to work. This thing over here is what? This is a scalar, right? And this term over here is also a scalar. Okay. So, if I say done, it's going to save this mess, but I don't want to undo it. So, I'm going to continue writing here. Um, so the scalar, um, the scalar works this way. So I've got the scalar was y, uh, sorry, the scalar was theta transpose phi of x times theta transpose phi of x, right? That is the scalar that I was interested in. Because it's a scalar, um, basically theta transpose phi of x is the same as phi 
transpose theta. Okay, those two are exactly the same. So I'm going to take this term and I'm going to just make it phi transpose x times theta. So those two are exactly the same. Good. And then in this crazy thing here, I'll, I'll show you again how we got there. Um, I've got theta. I think I haven't ever worked in tech before in my whole life. <laughs> We've got theta times this thing in the middle that, we shoot, that I showed in the previous slide, times theta. Oh, crazy. I do apologize <laughs> for the lack of zoom button. Okay, there we go again. Um, I also have the middle term over there, and then a lot of, lot of extra stuff. And for the purpose of this talk, I can completely ignore that. Okay, so, <laughs> so what's more, um, the likelihood is a product over independent examples, right? So it's a product over exponentials that has this little thing in the middle. So if I take a product of exponentials, I can take the exponential and just put the sum inside the exponential. So that's what's happening in the next line. So the sum goes inside the exponential. I've been slightly sneaky and squished it all the way to its subscript. So what I have is this product over there becomes a sum. It's inside the exponential and it becomes, goes inside the exponential. Um, and now I have an expression that is exactly in the form that I, I, I care about. It is parameters, parameters with some matrix in the middle, parameters and some vector. Cool. So what do you know of conjugate exponential stuff is that eventually this will become the precision matrix and this thing here will become the mean times precision vector. Right? Does that make sense to you? Okay, yes? I'm not familiar with that term. Okay, right. Um, so, remember we, 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 we parameterized a Gaussian in two ways. Either in its mean parameters or in a, uh, in a form which has theta transpose theta with some stuff in the middle and then theta transpose and some stuff. Okay? And this parameterization where we've pulled out theta so, that's, so that, other, so that um, other terms connect with it in a linear way, that's called the, the natural parameterization of a distribution or a Gaussian. Okay? Um, and what we want to do, or what, where we want to get to, is we want the distribution of theta. So we want to do a bit of algebra to pull out the mean and variance of theta that is a function of all the data that we've seen before. And so all that we've done so far is we've taken our Gaussian distributions, multiplied them together, and regrouped them so that there's a lot of stuff that sit in a mean and mean times precision um, vector and matrix. Okay? Yes, good. Okay, I'll show you in a second why this is magic, and it's magic. Oh, wow, all right. So we want to be tidy. Okay. So... We want to be tidy because I'm I'm going to take I'm going to take this term over here, which is what? That's a matrix. And I'm going to take this term in the middle, which is a vector, and I'm just going to write it as a matrix and a vector without this crazy summation because that, that confuses me. Okay? So so let's do the first one. Um, a tiny bit of algebra. So this, the, the mean time precision vector um, had a sum of, a, of y and then these sigma xn's. So I'm going to write it as a matrix times a vector. So for every data point, um, and my data points run this way, from 1 to n, I'm going to take phi of my data point, 
And remember, that becomes a vector. That takes my data point and it pushes into it into a vector. And I'm going to take that and I'm going to arrange it this way. And I'll stack them all together for data point one, data point two, all the way to data point n. And then, to actually get this, remember this guy over here is a vector, so the result should be a vector. So to get it, I'll take all my y's, which is scalars, and I'm, I'll stack them into one long, long, long vector. So I'll put y1 over there, y2, all the way to yn. If I now take this matrix vector product, I'll essentially get this thing over here. Cool with that? Um, the way I do it in my head is I, I literally go um, that one times that one plus that one times that one plus that one times that one plus that one times that one gives me the first entry. And then I go that one times that one plus that one times that one, etc. gives me the second entry in, in the, the, the final vector. Okay. Um, the next one will be tidy for is this outer product. You think, oh my goodness, what on earth is this? Um, I also thought that when I saw it the first time. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through the basics. Um, so this thing um, is an outer pro is a sum of outer products. So this, this embedding of x is a vector that looks like this. And if I transpose it, that guy over there is a vector that looks like that. So if I multiply these two vectors together, I should essentially get a matrix that looks like that. Right? And now I need to do this outer product for all of my data points, add, and then add all of these matrices together, and bam, I get another big matrix. That's the, that's, that's the final matrix. So this matrix over here, that's the sum of all of, the, all of um, these outer products, um, could be written in exactly the same way. So this entry over here would be this one times this one plus this one times this one plus all the way that to that one times that one. Um, and it's essentially the outer products. So um, I don't know if I could explain it in any better way except for to, um, except for to, to um, write it as a matrix times another matrix transposed. Okay? In other words, um, I put all my, my, design, my vectors from X in here and down that way, and that's why there's a transpose in that corner. Yeah. Yes, but just, just different entries. Okay. Um, and the last one um, that's not really important, um, but it's useful, is that I can write the sum of the y squares times alpha as all the y's as a vector and multiplied by some in the matrix. So this is essentially y1 times alpha times y1, um, which is essentially you know it, alpha times y1 squared, and, and to sum them together. So let's, let's skip this one for being tidy. Okay, so if we did all of this, we get an expression which, um, <coughs> which um, I think um, is one of the most useful things if you do any kind of Bayesian inference. If you do Kalman filters, if you do um, Bayesian inference for regression, for state space modeling. Um, because what we've done here is we've written out our likelihood at the top as something that says I've got theta times the matrix times theta plus theta times a vector plus some other stuff that we don't care about now. I also have my prior which is theta times a matrix times theta. There's actually nothing that sits in the linear term plus a normalizing constant. So the magic of conjugal, conjugate exponential distributions is that if I ever want to multiply these things together and I want to get the theta transpose theta term, I just take this stuff and this stuff and I add them up. If I want to take the linear term and you know, there's no linear term, I just take this plus zero and I've, I've got the linear term. 
and the result would be something that is in a Gaussian form that I can trick a bit and get the mean and precision out, or the mean and covariance. Okay, so why is conjugate exponentials useful? Um, because I can write a likelihood in a prior in a special form that makes math really easy. The hard part is that it takes a bit of work, pencil and paper, to get them into this, into this special form. Um, okay, and here we are. Um, I actually said try it out, but I don't think you want to try it out now. It's the time you have. Right, so here we go. Um, this is the final, final result. So to get my precision matrix, I just add these two things together, and to get my mean, mean, mean time precision, I just read it off from there. And how on earth do I recover my Gaussian? Uh, any, any ideas? Yes. Complete the square. There's an e even easier way. We know it's conjugate exponential. We know this is the precision. So to get the covariance structure of my Gaussian, I just invert it. To get the mean, that to mean, I take the inverse and I slap it on that side and I get the, um, I get the mean of the Gaussian. Um, so um, what have we done here, just for those who are thinking what's this about, um, is the product of these two things give me a Gaussian distribution that sits somewhere over there. I have a mean times precision and a precision for this Gaussian. So to get the covariance, I need to take the precision and I just invert it, and then I get the, the, um, the covariance of this guy. Said, yes, you're clever. To get the mean, well, what is the mean? The mean is just basically the mean times precision, which is this thing over here, multiplied by, you know what? We need, we need to get rid of this precision, so we multiply it by the precision inverse, and then bang, that's, that's the result for your mean. And you know what you've, you've solved for your very first Gaussian posterior distribution. Um, and there we have it. We've got the mean and the covariance um, of the posterior of the Gaussian. Okay, so we've got 15 minutes until we need to climb on buses. Um, so do we have any questions up to this point? Because all I've shown you now is to do linear regression of the Gaussian. Okay, yes. There's a question about the evidence. Actually... The question of, about the evidence is, um, is come, comes in here in the next slide. The evidence is, um, I showed you this fishy bit uh, that I always dropped. And this is really fishy, right? Where does that go to? So my, my confession is that that, that is really fishy. Um, we've skipped it, and that rolls up into, that part rolls up into the evidence. So what we've done in the last half hour is we've, say, we've said, I've taken the prior and the likelihood, and that is equal to five more, four more. <laughs> the spents are killing you. That is equal to <laughs> the prior times likely is equal to the posterior times the evidence. So we've taken the prior times likelihood, we've reshuffled it in a crazy way with lots of algebra, and that gave us that term. Whatever remains from the reshuffling, that is my evidence over there. And that could be used for model scoring and so on. I see a hand, yes. So, I'll kind of curious, um, when you were doing the general algebra expression, you were using truth. Yes. Oh, okay, so, um, so you can quickly rewrite this as trace. The, only, the, the trace makes it a linear operator. And the idea of a conjugate exponential distribution is that the, the product only applies to linear operators. Um, uh, so we could have forgotten about the trace. Yeah, forget I ever told you about the trace. Um, um, okay, so for those of you who are very technically minded, you can try and derive the normalizing constant at home. Um, Okay, so how will I make predictions? Now we've got 14 minutes left. Um, how do I get all these fluctuations that we started with? Well, first of all, um, we've got a distribution over theta, over red functions. 
I would now go and close my eyes and put my hand in the hat of theta the, from the posterior, pull out the theta, which is a parameter vector, and then draw that function. And of course, um, um, that would be one of these green functions over here. If I were to repeat the process and draw a function from this hat of theta posterior distributions, I would get a number of thetas, um, a number of functions. And I would repeat this. And of course, you can see that as you repeat it, there's a lot of fluctuation that you get further from the data. Um, I had no time to make my own, so I copied this from Zubin's, um, Zubin's slides. That's supposed to be a wizard because you're predicting the future from, <laughs> from data. Um, okay, so, um, so instead of doing the sampling, plotting, having green functions all over the place, I can actually analytically do this process as well and analytically compute the um, the posterior mean and variance. And I said, oh, well, you know, you can do this predictive distribution as homework, but um, I think I'll give you a, a, a sneak preview. Okay, so how do I get the mean of all these, these green functions? Um, okay, let's get the mean function. Um, it's another bit of math, which you have to forgive me for, um, but if you implement it, it's beautiful to see how it actually works. So I care about the expected function, the expected um, function given my data. And my function is my parameters times my um, high dimensional vector plus some noise around the process. So in this case, I assume that there's zero noise. Um, and this just means that I take the expected value of theta times my design vector. And what is my mean that I derived a few slides earlier? Ta -ta -ta. It, is, um, it is this thing in the middle, right? So it's, that's just my mean multiplied by um, that 5x vector that I've copied all the way down. Now I'll just reshuffle this whole business a bit so that it's easier to read. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to, what on earth did I do here? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yes, of course. There's a transpose over there. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> There's a transpose over there. So I put the Y, this Y to the front, Y transpose. This guy becomes a transpose. This matrix is symmetric, so I put it over there. And then there's some phi thing over there. So what you can see from this expression from the mean function is the following. To predict the, the mean function, anywhere, no matter how far you are from, the day, from, from your data, you are going to do a few operations. One is, you're going to take all your data points that you've already seen, all your y's, and your mean function will be a, function, a weighted sum of all these y's, okay? And the weighted sum is going to be some crazy inverse matrix that tells me how much each of these is important, multiplied by a function that, is, that just tells me um, uh, what, my, um, what my embedding vector x is. And of course, if you were to compute the variance of this thing, it'll look a little bit more intricate. Okay. So, um, someone asked about hierarchical priors the last few minutes. What on earth do I do with this alpha? Like, how do I set this, um, this alpha in a... Um, How do I set this alpha in a, in a Bayesian way instead of just guessing it? So some people would do what's called um, type, two, high, type 2 maximum likelihood, which is the, like they maximize the evidence with respect to this parameter. Um, other people would go and they would actually put the prior distribution on alpha because you have actually no idea of what, what it is and you want to also treat it as, an, as uncertainty. So in, a, in like sort of a true way of treating uncertainty, you just write a prior for alpha and then put alpha down as one of your random variables. So it's not an assumption anymore. Then the parameters of your prior become your, your assumption. Okay, right here. Um, so what about this problem? Um, a quick tour of all the complicate, complexities of Asian inference. If, for those of you who looked at the last example and said, what about me? What about this, this typo problem? Um, 
Um, how can we model that? Because so far we've modeled all our data as Gaussian noise. Um, how on earth shall we, shall we, um, shall we reconcile this? Um, so the way people would normally treat these is to, um, to, to make the likelihood some heavy tail distribution. So a quick picture here is that a Gaussian, a Gaussian would look like this, and a heavy tail distribution would really like stretch it out. And this, there are technical definitions, but it allows, it, it allows for typos. That's all you need to know in, in this case. Um, so in this case, the one way you could do it is to pick a t distribution of the same function as the mean, and then some extra, extra parameters. So a t distribution is a heavy tail distribution. Um, so once we, once we do this, we actually in trouble, we hit trouble in paradise, in Bayesian paradise, because I've now spent an hour wasting your time with a lot of complicated mathematics to get a Bayesian a posterior, that's Gaussian. In this case, the trouble in, in paradise, in our posterior, is that it's not Gaussian anymore. And so none of this manipulating of Gaussian distributions actually work. Um, so... So I was supposed to tell you exactly why there's trouble in paradise. And there's trouble in paradise because we, the normalizing constant, in this case, technically is like y given x, is the integral of all my priors, like y given x, blah, blah, times my prior of theta d theta. And this integral, if this is Gaussian, and this is Gaussian, then I can do it. If this thing here is a bunch of t distributions or anything else, then I can't do it analytically. Um, so that opens a whole bunch of technical discussions and two big themes in the last five minutes that you'll see in Bayesian inference. The first one is something called Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, and the second one is called variational methods. Okay? From a very high level, these two things do two totally different, you know, totally different approaches for treating the same problem. So, so let's go to Markov chain Monte Carlo methods first. Who of you have ever heard about it before? Okay, a good, good number of you. So it's the posterior is not Gaussian. Um, so the idea of Markov chain Monte Carlo methods um, is that inst is that I'm not equipped with the means to put my hand in a Gaussian hat and pull out a theta parameter and plot the green function anymore because my posterior distribution is not Gaussian. So Markov chain Monte Carlo methods re replace that hat that I put my hand in and analytically, in a e computationally easy way, pull out a, a vector. They place, replace it with a simulation that simulates, um, simulates samples from this. Um, so... Um, so the main workhorse of, of Monte Carlo methods, and the, the easiest one is, um, is something called Metropolis Hastings. Um, man, you're doing a lot in the last five minutes, but just, just, just remember all the names. Um, just remember all the keywords. Um, so, so essentially, if this was Gaussian, I could write a sampler in, in Python, and it's like, bing, I can get it out. If the posterior distribution of P of theta given X and Y has any crazy form like this, then I need to do something different. And the, the different thing is, if this is my theta axis, then I would, write, I would essentially write a random walk that's going to start at some point and try and walk around this axis, and it's going to do its walking proportional to how high this is. So imagine someone who's totally drunk, but they're always drawn to high peaks. <laughs> um, that's, that's Mark of Chain Monte Carlo for you. Um, to do, to do this in practice, um, I have um, a, no, a distribution, P of theta. I'll put a little star there because it's not normalized. I'm dropping all the conditionals to make it easier. And it does its random walk in, a, in an easy way. It says that the, the rule is that um, I, would, I would start at a point and then have some... Uh, traditionally symmetric proposal distributions, which is my random guy walking along this theta axis, okay? So I pick a new point, theta prime, from a Gaussian that's maybe centered around my current sample, theta. Now, 
if I'm a drunk guy who likes to walk uphill, if that sample is uphill, I always take it and I take the walk. If the sample is not uphill and it's downhill, I take the new sample proportional to how far I'm going downhill or how big the difference is. So that is going to bias this random walk to the, the peaks of this distribution or this mountainous area. Does that, that conceptually make sense for you? Okay, it's really easy. So f for instance, if the next step is there, I would basically take the difference between those two heights and with that probability I would step downhill. If, well, on the other hand, I stepped, took a next step and it took me to a point that's, that's higher density, I always accept it. Okay, the rule here is um, very simple. I started some theta. Um, I started some theta, sample a new theta from some proposal distribution. And classical Monte Carlo has this thing called an acceptance ratio. It's this idea of whether this drunk guy is going to walk uphill or downhill. The acceptance ratio is just, um, this is the uphill downhill ratio. It's the probability of starting at a point and going up, uphill or, or starting at a point and going to a new point divided by the probability of starting at the new point and going back to the old point. So of course, if that's bigger than one, I definitely walk uphill. So I like that. So the safest probability is just one if I go uphill or clamped if I walk downhill. And that's the process with which you, which you run your typical Monte Carlo sampler, sampler. Right here, okay. The stationary distribution in, um, stationary distribution is this like, um, if this random guy walks for infinity, what the distribution is that's going to pop out. Under some typical conditions, this is your posterior distribution. Um, the, 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 the theory that says when it's not going to be your, your posterior is, for instance, if um, you walk on a landscape with mountains and suddenly there's a wall and there's no way you could step through the wall and like the walls, um, like two states that, present, no, that prevent you. Um. Okay, um, so um, there's no time for free form discussion, but maybe I should um, just uh, mention a few things. Um, uh, in um, this idea of Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, Gibbs sampling is, that, is something that you'll encounter a lot. Um, if you do non-parametric Bayes, uh, if your theta vector is infinitely big, um, in some models this is the idea of collapsed Gibbs sampling. Um, we've not touched on variational inference at all, um, but I, I know this is going to be touched on at a, f a few points during this, this Indaba. Um, the other one that we've not touched on us at all, but that you might encounter is belief propagation or loopy belief propagation. Uh, in a nutshell, what that is, is um, so I've drawn you a picture of a graphical model or a factor graph. Belief propagation just means that I save a number for every node in the graph and the nodes exchange numbers and eventually it converges to some approximation of the, the posterior distribution that I care about. Okay. Um, last one maybe to note is that there's a whole family of Bayesian methods called non-parametric Bayes um, in which um, your theta vector, for lack of a better word, is infinitely big. So I, remember in the beginning we said, oh, if we want a fifth order polynomial, we make a theta vector six dimensions. If we want a tenth order polynomial, we make a theta vector 11 dimensions. Well, there are Bayesian methods for which the theta vector is infinitely big and you can still turn the crank and do all your um, calculations. Now lastly, for everyone who's not English speaking in here, um, Mr. Thomas Bay says thank you, but Mr. Pierre Simon Laplace um, <laughs> says merci. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I don't know if, um, if there are any time for questions because the buses are leaving exactly at half past six. So um, the party is at a place called Windsor Golf Estate. We've got bands there, loads of food. The party runs from seven until midnight. So where you need to go next is, and you, all, you should all go to the party, don't miss it. Where you should go next is a walk outside to where you've registered and there should be a long line of buses waiting, and we've tried very hard to let them be there, so I, I hope they're there. <laughs> okay. Um, half, half, past, half past six. Buses leave half past